This is part of a series of virtual conversations related to JASA's 50th anniversary exhibition, Meiji Modern, which will launch in, 20, launch in 2023. During the latter half of the 19th century, Japan rose to the world stage as a modern nation. This webinar will present the art of the Meiji era through the lens of multiple modernities. Japan was moving rapidly onto the international stage and its arts reflect this innovative period. As you watch the presentation, and if you happen to think of something that you think would be wonderful to include, we welcome you to uh, send us your suggestions. You can send them either to me or to Alison Tolman. But today we are especially delighted that we have a special guest, Michelle Yun Maplethorpe, Vice President of Asia Societies Global Artistic Programs and Director of the Asia Society Museum in New York. Michelle is joining us today to moderate a conversation with our exhibition co-curators, Bradley Smith Bailey of the Museum of Fine Arts Houston and Chelsea Foxwell, professor at the University of Chicago. It is such an honor to turn the podium over to Michelle and to Chelsea and Bradley. Thank you, Emily, for that kind introduction. It's a great pleasure to be with you all this evening, and I'd like to take this opportunity to express my appreciation to Mr. Wilson Graybill, President of Japanese Art Society of America, along with his esteemed colleagues, Amy Poster, Dr. Le Dr. Emily Sano, who we just heard from, Allison Tolman, and Victoria Melendez for their gracious invitation to participate in this special program. Asia Society and JASA have enjoyed a long-standing and fruitful relationship over the years, most notably through the success of Design for Pleasure, the 2008 exhibition we co-organized co to commemorate JASA's 35th anniversary. I'm delighted to have this opportunity in collaboration with JASA's 50th anniversary committee to reconsider the Meiji period in Japan with the notable scholars and co-curators of Meiji Modern, Dr. Bradley Bailey, the Tsing Sung and Wei Fong Chow Curator of Asian Art at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, and Professor Chelsea Foxwell, Associate Pure Professor of Art History at the University of Chicago. Their excellent exhibition premise aligns very closely with Asia Society's ongoing focus to champion the idea of multiple modernities as a counterpoint to the historically conceived notion that the development of modernism is a linear and Western concept. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bailey and Professor Foxwell this evening for what I anticipate will be a lively and insightful conversation. Welcome Chelsea and Bradley. Uh, your exhibition, Meiji Modern, 50 Years of New Japan, is a fresh perspective on this relatively well-known period. I'd love uh, if we could start off the conversation um, by your sharing how you came together to develop this idea. And if you could elaborate on your premise for the exhibition and in particular, how this new perspective is different from past assessments of this period. Uh, would either of you like to start? Chelsea, why don't you start? <laughs> sure. So uh, we're delighted that this uh, Meiji theme um, has been supported by JASA as a fitting opportunity to celebrate um, the 50th anniversary of JASA. And uh, really the Me Meiji period art was the first art that was collected as contemporary Japanese art in the US and of course in Europe as well. And so many of the stories of the objects that we show are you know, stories of individuals such as Japanese watercolorists and oil painters who were able to come uh, to the US and you know, even have their uh, works shown in, uh, at the Art Institute or the Museum of Fine Arts Boston or the Girlier Club uh, you know, while they were alive and able to actually interact with American patrons and receive feedback. 
So um, this is one of uh, the things that we would like to highlight since uh, JASA um, also represents 50 years of amazing collecting and support for all periods of Japanese art. Um, let's see, Bradley, do you wanna take it from there? Yeah, I think that that's, all those are excellent points. And I think it's a wonderful way to build off of the, the Edo, Edo period show that we did with Asia Society for the, the earlier anniversary, because in examining these, these kind of different modernisms, it's, it's really interesting to see that a lot of the things that we, that we think of as constituting modernism were, were actually you know, a, a public restaurant life uh, uh, many, many of these, uh, like mass literacy, many of these things that we think of as constituting public life were actually present in the Edo period, but the Meiji period is, is fascinating. And what we're trying to, what we're trying to show, um, with regards to, especially the, the idea of modernity itself, even more than one modernity, what constitutes a modernity is that the at the time Japanese art and and the Japanese government was very much highlighting some of these these pre-existing things that do constitute modernism even aesthetic modernism with regards to compositions off-center you know perspective all these things but also it's it's uh it's a time when this this capital M modernism was also presented to the outside world which mm -hmm. is a very big contrast to the Edo period so that's what we're really trying to highlight in this, this exhibition that is in, in this very relatively short period of time. Now we, we have a, a kind of highlighting of a, a past modernism, almost historic modernism that exists and that the West drew upon for their own language of modernism, but also a really strongly self-articulated, self-determined modernism based only not based not only on Japanese history, but based also on Japanese reception mm -hmm. of international motifs. I mean, I think that just even redefining what modernism is and who defined it in that contemporary moment is important as a premise. I mean, when we think about European and Western art history, you know, thinking about the Impressionists and the post-Impressionists who were kind of these precursors or foundations for this development of 20th century modernism. I mean, many of them like Manet and his contemporaries were looking at Japanese prints and looking to the East for inspiration. And so I really appreciate that point of, you know, you're talking about, you know, this kind of confluence, this cross-cultural confluence on equal footing, not mm -hmm. that one was derivative over, you know, to the other, but that it was really a real dialogue between these cultures that allowed for this flourishing of this new way of thinking and this new way of creating art. Um, and I would be interested also just, you know, not even in that dialectic between East and West, but also interregionally, because, you know, as we know, Japan was such a hub a cultural hub for um, other East Asian countries, which has its own complications. Um, mm -hmm. But maybe we could speak about that a little bit as well, about kind of that regional emergence of a modernist sensibility. Sure, yes. And maybe I, here will be a good time to share my screen. Um... So Japanese art in the Meiji period for a long time had a reputation of uh, being um, on, the, on the verge of modern art, but not fully modern. And so you know, this is an old view that defined modern as coming out of the West mm -hmm. and um, as thereby dubbing Japanese versions of, of you know, engaging with 19th century art as being somehow, you know, um, aping modernism, right, or getting it wrong, and uh, this is a this is an old, you know, outdated uh, version of understanding, you know, artistic production that we very much want to counter. And um, by looking at these works, to really uh, point out that the ways in which they are modern are not necessarily the ways that um, modern art has been defined thus far. So uh, for example, um, with these, uh, this bronze koro or incense burner, right, that's being supported by a demon, you see you know, incredible uh, technical prowess, uh, but also a kind of meta 
meta art, you know, kind of thinking about um, that bronze was traditionally used to make, you know, uh, for example, incense burners. But in this case, having the incense burner itself be held by this, this impish demon who's exterior to the, to the object itself. And so this is a work that presents ja the Japanese past, including past forms of Japanese art, such as an incense burner, in a very self-aware way. And then in locating that, um, that demon uh, and, and having the incense burner just slightly off kilter based on his, his two individual hands shows um, a great sensitivity to the, to the object and on kind of understanding of how realism is inter interacting with uh, earlier traditions of making. And I think that's an interesting point to just consider for a moment, because when we think about the development of Western modernisms, it was much more of a kind of turning away from tradition and past art making practices. But I think what you're pointing out here, Chelsea, is that it's a reconsideration of the past. And so it's not kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater, but it's like utilizing the history and building upon that in an innovative and fresh way, which is I think very different um, and yeah. what makes this unique. Um, yeah, I would agree. And then I wouldn't wanna use, you know, terms such as hybrid or, um, you know, blended for these. I think this is a very self-aware, you know, juxtapos bringing a very self-aware and kind of full of agency way of juxtaposing past and present. And so I don't think it's accidental. It's not like modern elements were kind of inadvertently tainted with the past in, in a way that Western modernism, it was different from Western modernism, but a kind of very self-aware engagement of, of with the past at the same time, uh, under, understanding that uh, Meiji art was gonna be different and forward looking. Mm -hmm. And I think that really, extends to the use of materials, right? Because I think a lot of the materials have been used historically, but through industrialization and a reconceptualization of how these materials could be implemented or new practices of, of the technical process um, was able to create new um, interpretations of both the material and the subject matter. Would you say that would be correct? Yeah, and I think Bradley also has been thinking a lot about material. Uh, are there any particular slides you wanna show? Um, well, I mean, this, this is a beautiful one, but I think almost any, if we could just, any of the slides that we pick, we, we would see that the, um, one of the in very interesting things about the way material is used and it, it builds off of what Chelsea was just saying is just like this Koro supported by Raijin, it, 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 it is kind of reliant on the past and very much on tradition. I mean, even just looking at this object, a lot of what this object is citing is Japanese tradition. Even if we look at the way those, those beautiful swallows are arranged on the top over what looks to be a, a bamboo basket being broken apart by, by is this is kind of meant to be the God of winds bag, but wow. you know, it's presented, it is presented in a way um, that, it, it is showcasing some classic Japanese motifs, perhaps for perhaps for an international audience, but also for a modern audience that is that is invested in a very certain kind, a very certain take on Japanese um, history. If we can, could we go on to? I, I can't remember what the next slide after this, but I'm sure if we if we just advance to the next slide. Who's control? Do I control it? I think it, Chelsea, I think you're, uh, it's your slideshow. Is that right? You're managing the slide. Let's see, did Chelsea freeze? I think Chelsea she, is yes, frozen. She did. she did freeze. Oh no. Well, I, I will tell you that this this piece in, in particular is, is fascinating because it, it uses patination techniques developed during um, the Edo period and, and preceding centuries for metalwork and for samurai armor, but it's also the presentation of a Japanese deity um, in a different context. So what Chelsea was talking about and the kind of the use of the, the past for uh, a very modern uh, present and modern future is, is very important. And, and religion does figure strongly into our, our presentation. I can wait for her to come back to show you some of these images, but I'll just say that 
we have been looking at in terms of technique and in terms of classical imagery, a lot of what that you will, a lot of the things that you'll encounter if you come to uh, see Meiji modern is um, many, many motifs that you might be familiar with in, mm -hmm. in Japanese art. For example, we can, we can go back one slide. Oh, oh sure. This, Sorry. This, this, oh, it's Helen. Thank you, Helen. <laughs> Um, Sorry, guys. Hold on one second. Uh, you'll see many, many motifs, but, but realized in a in a way that you might be um, you might perhaps be unfamiliar with, or that might be surprising for you. So, one of the, the 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 genres that actually does grow during the Meiji period is bird and flower prints and bird and flower paintings, and so these take on a real modernist um, connotation in this period. And I think looking at this extraordinary. Uh, pair of screens from Kirk Gitter's collection, you can see a real confluence of technique and the real emergence of what we would now, what would now by 1904 be a codified quote unquote Japanese style painting, Nihonga, Japanese style. The, the, the kind of merging of many, many different schools of Japanese painting to make something that is now viewed as iconically Japanese in, in, in an international context. So in addition to artists like Takeuchi Seho, who with this painting, you have a real blending of styles in these screens. You have birds, especially the crows that have an almost animated, um, almost cartoonish uh, expression on their face. They really appear alive with um, a style of ink painting for these branches that is at once Mariyama Shijo school, but also almost photographically realistic. It's really extraordinary. And someone like Takeuchi Seho studied studied abroad, studied in Europe. Um, and so we're, we're looking at very much kind of um, these fusion, uh, Chelsea didn't want to say hybrid and I don't want to say hybrid either because it's almost an emergent, a self-determinative form of modern painting. And one of the works that um, we're excited to show is a, a work that in the, in the same style by Yamaga Seika from the Collins collection, that is a work that Japan actually sent in 1912 to Amsterdam for an international exhibition. So these are very much, you know, classic motifs that are then self-determined to be representative of classic Japanese-ness, mm -hmm. but also modern art on an international stage by the Japanese themselves. And so that's what we're, is very exciting about this exhibition is that we're not simply determining, you know, going back and kind of picking things that we think of as modern. We are looking at things that were collected in the period as modern, but also things that were self-consciously and purposely presented in the period. And, and, I, and I think, Bradley, that's something talking about, you know, the contemporary connoisseurship of this material. I think that's something that is very unique to your presentation or your concept as well, that, you know, I think almost exclusively the works that you're, you and Chelsea are considering are from American collections that were collected contemporaneously to the time that these works were made in Japan. And I guess I would love if the two of you could talk a little bit about, you know, we have touched a little bit on this fluidity of cross-cultural borders and the ability for artists to study abroad and kind of, um, you know, their influence on the West, but maybe talk a little bit about you know, who is the intended audience for these materials? And so, you know, as they're deciding on the compositional structure and creating this innovative new visual and formal vocabulary, but also the symbology that is involved in the few examples that we've already discussed, you know, how were these works meant to be received and consumed and by who? Um, that would be great to hear. Well, Chelsea, do you want to do do you want to do some of the paintings, and I could do prints? Sure. Yeah. Yes. So it, there's quite a variety, um, and in many cases, it's not easy to you know have a clear distinction between works that were being produced for Japanese viewers and works that were being produced for um, for domestic viewers. Uh, you know, we have some some things such as, you know, robes that were meant to be worn. And um, at this time, there there was an incredible discourse about um, the scientific and what the what Western science can tell us about the, the supernatural. And so we see uh, a very self-conscious way in which 
um, tales of the supernatural in this period are not being um, are not becoming less popular because of you know the um, influx of, of science and even the study of psychology, but you know, I think we might coming have directly. And so a work like this by Kawanobe Kyosai, uh, Kyosai was incredibly popular um, in, in Tokyo, you know, in his native Tokyo among Japanese um, audiences, but he also had many foreign friends, including the, the British architect, Josiah Condor. Uh, and uh, this was a, a painting now in the Western collection that was originally in Condor's, uh, Condor's you know, collection. And so on the one hand, you know, Kyosai was a socialite in Japan and his works speak directly to Japanese audiences, but at the same time, you know, they're in incredibly popular among, you know, Western audiences. And then we have uh, this, this is a watercolor in the Indianapolis Museum of Art by an oil painter named Nakagawa Hachiro. It, it was done during his uh, visit to the, to the US. Um, around 1902 or 1903, it's believed. And uh, Nakagawa made several trips abroad. He worked in both oils and watercolors. So you can um, see kind of the way that he's using, you know, water knee to show scenes uh, that would help, you know, Western viewers understand uh, what it would be like to do Hanami in Japan, right? Cherry blossom viewing. Uh, which we're about to come into right now. And so um, kind of revisiting Japanese scenes uh, with you know, these uh, watercolor techniques that were very popular around this time. Bradley, can I hand it over to you? Sure, yeah. Would you, could you go back to maybe the, that, that opening slide that's the, the Syracuse images of the emperor and, uh, and uh, Empress Haruko? We can start with that and then we can talk about some prints. Because as Chelsea said, we the the, the audience it's not a distinct audience in the way that we have in, in some periods, say of, of Chinese porcelain or something, where we have this is an imperial piece, this is an export piece. Sometimes the objects made for domestic consumption and export and export, um, the line between them is, is often blurred, and some of the finest pieces might be made for an international. Oh no, I do. Oh, Chelsea's back, or you're back. Could you, could you take us to the, the first slide? Are you still there? I don't know. Can I, can I hop in? Would it be easier, Chelsea and Bradley, if maybe I shared the screen on my end and then it, it takes up less bandwidth on Chelsea's internet? Yes, sure. let's do that, Helen. That would okay. be really great. If Thank, you. Thank you so much. So you'll see, so this, this, these are central images to, to the show and I think to the Meiji period. And this is one of the things that we'd like to, to get out there with the idea of Meiji modern. And one of the interesting things about consumption of the period is that we're look, we look at a lot of, especially Japanese prints um, that are artwork that are very laudatory, celebratory of the emperor, celebratory of the, the Japanese imperial expansion at the time, the, the Japanese empire. And these are not propaganda in a strict sense. These are not government issued. These are in fact objects, objects of popular consumption. And one of the very interesting things about the Meiji period, one of the big shifts that I talk a lot about is the shift from the Edo period when the, the image of the emperor is sacrosanct, just the point that one is not even really meant to look upon him, mm -hmm. Uh, to we need we need somebody as the head of state and this is one of the very interesting things I think about studying this period and about this exhibition is that when we look at some of the historical things that the Meiji government instituted as national symbols as national traditions the things that constitute a quote-unquote capital M modern state you start to realize that these are also some of the underpinnings of western modernism like if you want to start a western superpower you you need an empire, but you also need a bird of prey. You need many, many symbolic things and you need the image of a figurehead. So images like this were disseminated widely and they're really only based on one or two photographs uh, of the emperor. And so they're often hand colored uh, like this when we have an, a uniform like this in the show. But if we could go on to the next uh, slide. Yes, 
So images like this were also extremely popular. Um, and this is, this is a, a presentation of the um, Empress Haruko to a field station. And this apparently did, did happen. Um, but this, this kind of blurs the line between reportage and popular culture, somewhat uh, propagandistic. But what you notice here, in addition to the very modern printing techniques, because these are modern inks and things, is a, a modern, a very, very modern scene, but with traditional Japanese elements. I think the most strikingly modern thing is perhaps the hairstyle and the clothes, which will come through in this exhibition. Um, but she's presenting uh, rolled up bandages at a, at a Red Cross field hospital. But then you notice in the background things in that left panel, like a, uh, a floral arrangement that's almost meant to conjure traditional, like almost Kano school ink painting. So this Meiji modern that we're trying to assert is both in a, an assertion very much self-determined by the Japanese uh, government and by um, Meiji period, you know, Japanese intellectuals that they belong on, they tick all the boxes of this capital M Western style modernism, but there's also highlighting really important images and symbols, deities, rituals, traditions from Japanese culture that become um, very important to almost to the mythos of this, this empire. And um, so we have we have images in the show, for example, of, of waves crashing, and, and these might be regarded as simple seaside scenes, but in a country with a very strong navy, um, they have kind of a, a, a multifaceted reading. And that's one of the things we're really trying to get through with this show. And I think that's one of the aspects of your purview that is so fresh, is thinking about these art objects, not just as formalistic ideals, but you know, as a vehicle for soft power or diplomacy or to really kind of asserting this kind of geopolitical might and, and um, you know, really embodying in a physical way or a very visceral way, Japan's um, interests and, you know, kind of inroads in becoming part of this modern world, you know, a leader in this modern world. And, and I would be interested, you know, to, get a better sense from both of you, you know, how this was translated through the society. I mean, because what we you had just mentioned, Bradley, is, you know, the hairstyles in this very Western dress. And I think when we were talking the other day, I don't know if you have an image of it, but just kind of these paper dolls that, mm -hmm. you know, could be used, these prints. And so using these um, aesthetic techniques to uh, really engage uh, the society in new ways. Yeah, there's definitely the wig print in there. Slide 17, Helen. Slide 17, yeah. Oh, you yeah. passed it. Yeah. yeah, so here yeah, yeah, you see you see a, a really really interesting thing, which is that we have kind of kabuki kind of adapting to this is really the two, I think the two sides of Meiji modern. One is kind of a traditional art form where foreign objects such as this Western style mirror enter and they're integrated into a traditional Japanese framework. And the other is this almost adaptive mode where this print um, shows these, continues this kind of tradition of the fashionable courtesan that you find from the Edo period, but to a fashionable lady wearing a French style gown and different French style haircuts. And yet to your point, this was, you know, the tar in a way that the, the true target audience for a work like this would be children who would cut it up and, and put those hairstyles on that lady, but it fits into this existing, um, you know, there's just, there's, there's just a long tradition of wigs <laughs> in Japan. So it, it fits very nicely into, into this tradition. And I think also you had mentioned, you know, with this, these new technologies, having that broader palette again, and being able to use these kind of a, you know, more, intense and kind of diverse colors to um, to illustrate these kinds of images right using exactly that. no more no more Edo period sumptuary laws so you're allowed to really and, and that's one of the great things about this period is that we have a confluence of technique and really fine um, materials yeah and oh go ahead Michelle no please go ahead go ahead Chelsea Oh, I was going to, um, you know, talk of address something that you uh, raised earlier, which is, um, you know, that how 
uh, you know, this Meiji period also represents uh, Japan's kind of rethinking of itself, of its own position in Asia, right, in ways that we know would have quite sinister developments with colonialism. Um, and that's definitely, you know, something that we can, you know, see in the Meiji, Meiji works is that it's not just a two-dimensional thing past and present or Japan and the West, but there is also, you know, a traditional Chinese culture um, in there. So I wonder, Helen, if you can go to slide uh, 10. Yeah. Yes. So uh, Nakayama Saiho was a female literati painter and, and female artist who was trained with um, Araki Kampo. And um, her, her work, you know, connects is, you know, Qing court style, a very realistic, you know, finding kind of realism was not just based, something that was based in, you know, Western art, but also that uh, Qing Chinese art with its incredible technical refinement also provided a model for, um, you know, for the realism of Meiji art. And um, this painting pairs the peacocks with wisteria, which on the other hand was a, you know, a, a Japanese symbol connected to the Fujiwara family and appearing in Japanese poetry, you know, since the classical times. And so uh, we can see, you know, these symbols like that. And if you could turn to the next slide, Saiho later married um, a gentleman from, from Kyushu and moved to Korea after, um, you know, at 1910, Japan um, annexed Korea and it became part of the Japanese empire. And um, Saiho continued to be active as an artist in Korea. And um, my, one of my students recently introduced me to this painting by the Korean female artist, Jung Chang Yong, who also trained with Araki Kampo and is working in a very similar style. So, um, you know, the artistic exchange we see here is, is truly kind of multi-dimensional. No, that's wonderful. I mean, in, you know, in our conversation the other day, you were really talking about Japan's centrality in the Sinosphere, you know, and I, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on that, you know, even on top of what we we're discussing just now with kind of this, um, you know, confluence of interregional influences. Um, sure. Uh, so, Helen, if you can go back three slides. Let's see. There is this screen pair in the Art Institute of Chicago by another female uh, Chinese style painter, Noguchi Shohin. And it's incredibly detailed and it shows the great Chinese sage of calligraphy, Wang Shichir. So here he is in the orchid pavilion admiring the geese, you know, which are elements kind of from his biography. And um, so uh, this painting, uh, you know, Shohin participated in Japanese domestic exhibitions, including the 1895, you know, Kyoto exhibition and 1895 being, you know, also the year that Japan was, you know, in, um, in engaged in the first Sino-Japanese war. So um, what does it mean for this female painter who was trained in, you know, various Chinese styles, um, painting uh, this incredibly detailed work um, that doesn't show a single woman, actually, you know, it's all kind of men and boys that are uh, in engaging in the spring, you know, poetry composition party. Um, so, uh, this work, you know, is point is you know looking back to the past tradition uh, where Japanese felt that the Sinitic tradition of of calligraphy and of um, Chinese lore and texts was their kind of tradition as well. But now uh, that the geopolitical context is is changing in Japan, um, not kind of being content to accept the old order with China as the center and very aggressively kind of challenging that order. Um, so there's a kind of not a resolution, you know, I think there's multiple, you know, ways that we can see this work as, as being a product of its time. Mm -hmm. And I would be curious, you know, because this was collected by Western um, collectors, you know, 
what how did that shift shape and shift connoisseurship in the west towards asian and particularly you know japanese contemporary art at that time um, if it did at all sure yes and at the beginning you know um People, there were many Western connoisseurs and collectors who were trying to find the difference between Chinese and Japanese art, you know, and so um, that you have people like Fenelosa, Ernest Fenelosa in the 1880s, who goes over to Japan you know, and uh, tells the Japanese that they need a national style and they therefore need to separate from Chinese styles and, um, you know, that the Japanese understanding of um, you know, whether it's desirable and possible to separate their art from, you know, uh, Chinese, the Chinese classics is something that different, each kind of artist has to, you know, confront and uh, work through in their own way. So, um, Shohin, in this work, uh, if you can go to the next slide, on the back of this slide, she has, uh, in the back of this screen, rather, screen pair, she has a silver ground um, image in a lightly brushed style of geese. Once again, you know, Wang Shiju loved geese and reeds. And so um, this work is also a Chinese theme, but it alludes to Japanese medieval kind of uh, Zen. This was, you know, the geese and reeds was a theme that was very uh, well known among medieval Japanese Zen works and um, was also popular in Korea. So in a way, uh, this is a time when you have Chinese artists who are and Chinese intellectuals who are coming to Japan to study, right? So it's a reversal of the, you know, for most of Japanese history, it was Japanese monks and, and who would go to China to study. And so within that reversal, I think Japanese works also prompted Chinese artists to rethink, um, you know, how they can also uh, produce art in a way that, you know, um, balances Chinese, the Chinese past with kind of innovation. I think that's excellent. I mean, I, I, I would say that the, within the show, that's one of the, the themes that we're trying to encapsulate as well as it's almost contradictory theme, which I don't know, Helen, if you can find the, the slide of the Mishima Shoso with the tigers and the Japanese soldiers, which is only- Slide six, Helen. So if you go six. back to back, Thank there you. we go. Which is only, you know, um, what, like five years before, I think maybe five years before the, the Noguchi Shohin painting that we just saw. And this is where you, where you, I, I often like in the relationship of Japan to China in this period, almost like, almost like um, Napoleonic France and Rome. Mm -hmm. It's this thing that, it's this empire where, you, where you, have, you have derived so much of your tradition from it and you're trying to, to kind of show that and on one hand revere it with things like Noguchi Shohin, but at the same time, the, you, in a contemporary world, you're trying to be an imperial power, you're trying to colonize this country. So how do you inhabit those two impulses? And I think this is a, this is a fabulous Meiji work, you know, a work of this size and complexity would have been too expensive for the Edo period, but it's also about a quote unquote contemporary event. That's these, these Japanese soldiers with this incredible Meiji facial hair. You also find them, people have wild beards and mustaches, government officials in the Meiji period, but they are, this, this was a print that was meant to do a lot of, a lot of different things. One, it was meant to reference photography and, and to, to be able to capture moonlight, which would have been a, a fantastic achievement in printing to showcase modern Meiji guns and uniforms, but also to, in a subtle way, ridicule, not a, actually not a subtle way, but ridicule the Chinese as apparently as quote unquote, in a propagandistic kind of way, using tigers to attack. Of course, tigers hunt alone. They do not hunt in packs. Nothing about this is remotely true. Um, but it's, it's a spectacular scene and it's, it's even a better Meiji scene because the Meiji period is the first time when Japanese artists themselves, thanks to an Italian circus, actually saw live tigers. So that part, part of their opening to the West is what enables them to kind of create these propagandistic images. It's a weird, it's a very, um, it's very meta. It's a very, it kind of um, refracts in upon it itself, this idea of Meiji modernity, which is, you, you are given these things from the outside and you immediately figure out the best way to use them to, to kind of further 
um, your own aesthetic further further the government. And that's why I find this to be a fascinating, fascinating work because it at once is is a is an example of kind of fasc fascination with the West, but also kind of a, a mimicry of a, a Western um, imperial power with you know with real world implications. I think it's a, a fantastic object and, and a very rare impression. So this is the kind of thing that we want to show um, in Meiji Modern is that sometimes, you know, the, that this, this, this story of, of Japanese modernity is actually quite fraught and not a direct line. It does have many complicated relationships that are not simply Japan and the West or Japan and America, um, Korea, China, Southeast Asia, Russia, all of these, um, these nations and, and civilizations have uh, very important interactions with the Meiji government that, that shapes its idea of what constitutes modernity. I love that, you know, the work that you're thinking about and that you're bringing together through the context of this exhibition really are so rich in terms of all this kind of symbology and nuance, not again, not just about the formalistic evolution of the arts and culture of Japan at this time, but really talking about this underlying sense of self and place in this larger kind of growing global world. Um, and, you know, I think that a lot of the works that you and Chelsea have been thinking about and intend to include also through their very creation and the kinds of materials and the use of the materials, I think, especially in the sculptures, really embodies that ambition and that um, statement, you know, of Japan's um, desire to place themselves within this context. And I don't know if you have any examples of those that you might be able to share or thinking about, you know, through the thematics that you have um, created to develop the exhibition. Um, you could elaborate that, on that a little bit. Oh, you're muted, Chelsea. I was gonna say, Chelsea, do you wanna start this one? Sorry, I was gonna say, did you wanna talk about some of the vases? Or maybe can you go way to the, um, go to the end of the PowerPoint, Helen, uh, number 35? So much good stuff. Please come to the show. Look at all this crazy <laughs> stuff. Yeah, it's a phenomenal selection. Of is it this, this one? Oh, no, one we're at 30, this is it. This, you can stop here too. <laughs> you know, while we're here, yeah, that was a um, a cloisonné bowl. Uh, yeah, and this, but this one, is this well, one, yeah. Yeah, the um, Namikawa Sosuke, um, that cloisonné at this time period was also, um, you know, painting had of course developed and changed. And one of the things that Meiji painters were really concerned with was the status of outline in, in painting, you know, and you get actual write-in questions in journals of the time that said, you know, there are no outlines in around things in the real world and Western artists don't use them. So therefore, I don't think we should use them either. And so kind of, you know, um, getting right down to the nuts and bolts of painting and figuring out, you know, how can we make Japanese style painting, but discarding, you know, outline, which is the, the line and the brush, you know, you know how central that is to East Asian art. So um, then within these other art forms, you have the development, for example, with Nami Kawasosuke of the wireless cloisonné, where, uh, you know, that the, the cloisson, the, the kind of uh, the very idea of cloisonné is that you have, um, you know, vitri vitrified material that's bordered by, you know, uh, copper or some other kind of a metal metal wire, and so um, he endeavored to sink the wires uh, into the vessel so that the outlines are not shown on the outside, and therefore painting the, the cloisonné uh, takes on an effect that approximates. Um, modern Japanese painting with its lack of outlines. So you can see here with the um, the, the cock and hens in the snow that how um, how much pain was taken to depict the the piled up and fluffy snow well, without having the intervention of those black outlines that would have been present in traditional uh, cloisonné. 
so much yeah it's so seamless I mean and it's so such a different sensibility I think it's much more fluid and um and animated I think in it. and in the blending of the different you know the different cloisons in there yeah. in, in the the coloration of the the chickens but this is also in in many ways this is this is an object that is again emblematic of this period the the subtitle for the show comes from um Count Okuma's kind of description of the Meiji period, this book that he wrote to, to show all of Japan's achievements. And he spends a lot of time talking about cloisonne because this is an area in which even at the time it was acknowledged that Japan was the world leader. And so that's why with this slide, we included the, you know, the, original, the original um auction listing from 1893, because these were sold at auction oh, okay. in 1893. Um, as kind of imported contemporary art, uh, really high technical achievements. And so it's, it's really, you know, it's an extraordinary moment because you, you have, we have, it's an, unlike previous periods in Japanese art, we do have American collectors able to access artists like Sosuke, who is in the, you know, imperial collection. They're not buying, you know, second and third rate things. They're buying the exact same things that the imperial family is buying. So it's a really spectacular period for not only for Japanese art, but for Japanese art in America, which is, I think, what we're really trying to, to show with uh, this exhibition. Oh, certainly. We have a couple of minutes left before we head to the question and answer period. Is there any parting thoughts that either of you would like to share with our audience about either, you know, the uh, this exhibition particular elements of um your concept behind the exhibition that we haven't touched on yet well i'll i'll, I'll go first and I, I will say that i'm very very excited about this because um as a curator and scholar of japanese art the meiji period is actually what brought me to japanese art and i think that it it Every time I show a piece of Meiji period art, like these incredible Sosuke pieces from Susan Tosk's collection, any, anything like this, if I were to show to a colleague of mine in European or American decorative arts, their, their eyes absolutely light up. Nobody can believe um, the technique and the materials and the care and the stylization and the real, again, the real modernism of these pieces. So I am very excited for specialists, but also for the general public to be able to come to the show. And I think it will bring a lot of people to Meiji art, to Japanese art, and hopefully to the Asia Society and Japanese Art Society of America. Wonderful, thank you. Any last thoughts, Chelsea, before we uh, start to dig into the questions? Sure, you know, the Meiji period also, you know, is, is something that endlessly fascinates me. And now we are in this moment where we're trying to come out of this pandemic and we're thinking about, we're asking ourselves about the ways that we are changed and how institutions are changed, how art itself is, is changing and artists are responding to these challenges. And um, we can see these, you know, this question of how does art change? How, does, how do we see problem solving uh, on the, you know, kind of uh, social, uh, and geopolitical front, as well as in the as the work in the works of individual artists, and so I feel like the Meiji period um, speaks uh, uh, to that problem of making art in a time when traditional patronage networks fall apart, and you have to reinvent yourself. For example, or in a time when kind of um, you know the um, priorities have national priorities have changed, and so the art looks different and. Uh, so I too hope that uh, some of that, those universal questions can come through in this exhibition. Fabulous, thank you both. Um, so we do have a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, the first one, uh, I think, you know, you can both answer, but it, refer it references the coro that you first brought up, Chelsea. So the question is, do you think this coro that you showed uh, the first slide uh, references Atlas and Western imagery as, par as part of its modernism. If you could share your thoughts on that. Sure, just a moment, please. Um, I'm gonna try to endeavor to um, share my screen. Um, 
and smaller. Are you seeing the, yes. the work in question? Okay. So uh, what I find this, I find that this work is scrupulous in actually uh, trying to reference uh, motifs that were familiar, you know, including the, the Raijin, right? The, um, those uh, Fujin and Raijin, the gods of wind and thunder and, and cranes and, and these swallows, but uh, the, it's on this, you know, small level that we see, um, you know, maybe the Western sculptural consciousness. So uh, for example, this, the Raijin figure who's holding up the koro, that his belly is um, coming over his, the, his skirt or his shorts in just the very slightest way. Um, but Bradley, you're also, so I think that this is, this is where we see kind of a revisiting of, of motifs that we're already familiar with in Japanese art. I don't know, Bradley, if you, um, you're quite familiar with this object, if you wanna to speak to that question. Oh, I just think there is, um, there's also, I, I think uh, something, I can't recall going on with, you know, he's, he has kind of that jewelry, which is unusual. Mm -hmm. And perhaps related to, to um, Buddhism. Um, yeah, the Indian origins, right, yeah. of, of Buddhism. And so there are, in all these objects, there are kind of subtle, there are subtle kind of things that if, if you, and I think that's the brilliance of Meiji art because it's a very self-conscious kind of presentation to, to the outside world. So many of these objects, if you are a Westerner, you could look at them and say, oh, Japanese motifs, you know, bamboo, swallows, a crane, wisteria, and a little, and a little demon. But if you're, if you're uh, an intense Meiji nationalist, you can look at this and be like, it's the great god Raijin, look at all this beautiful, you know, Japanese metalwork that we have descended from our tradition of armor. Uh, look at this bamboo basket ripping apart. Meiji art really is the finest and imitative surface things. And also, you know, the truth is Raijin is, he, in truth, he is a continental god. So maybe the Japanese empire should be this expansive view. I mean, there's lots of ways that you could look at this, especially uh, uh, given the size of a coral like this. It's very much a Meiji object. It was not really meant, I mean, it would be fabulous to burn incense out of, but it wasn't really meant to burn incense. It was really meant to be a true object dar kind of to be to be mm -hmm. yeah fabulous um so let's move on to the next question uh this question asks both of you in your conceptualization of meiji modernism are you planning to address japan's relationship with china and the interchange between chinese and japanese artists i think you've touched upon that a little bit during the course of our conversation but do you anticipate that to be one of kind of the the major threads through the exhibition? I think it's definitely a thread that, um, you know, if you didn't address it, it wouldn't be the Meiji period, right? That uh, in the Meiji period, we, the you know, whole period is defined by a kind of reaction to, um, a reaction to Western imperialism, right? These gunboats, US gunboats showing up on Japan's doorstep and at that time, Japanese intellectuals had already been discussing the opium wars in China, right? And um, so there was, um, you know, there, there was also this use of kind of the threat of the continual threat of Western invasion to justify doing things that people otherwise wouldn't, didn't, didn't necessarily want to do. And those could be you know, reforming um, the education system, you know, or they could have been, and, and, but they're also involving um, Japan's, you know, regrettable foreign policy choices. So one thing that's so interesting to me is that in the, um, in the Meiji period, um, Sinophile art, you know, art that's based on, uh, excuse me, art that's based on the Chinese classics, um, in, the, in this period, uh, you see, you know, in, in fact, the Chinese literati painting was a, you know, a convenient vehicle for female artists because um, its language of amateurism allowed women to be able to have, you know, uh, have uh, their social identity as, you know, wives and mothers in some cases, um, but also be able to paint. Um, and so, and you also have, 
uh, you know, Meiji, the, the people who affected the Meiji restoration had all been trained in the Chinese classics and thought. And, you know, so thinking about um, this really as a three-way, uh, you know, I would love to encourage viewers to think about this as a three-way, as a multinodal period, mm -hmm. so that the, the key word is not Japan in the West, but Japan um, in, in a changing uh, global order. And then maybe this could lead us to the next question um, from our colleague, Christine Guff, that I think kind of goes along that thread of these nodals. Um, her question is asking if the exhibition will also include American artists who are active in the Meiji, it, active in Meiji Japan, who can kind of throw into relief this theme of multiple modernisms and thinking about this multi multiple nodalities. Um, if that's something that you're considering. Oh. Well, first of all, hello, Christine. <laughs> uh, uh, we, we haven't we haven't uh, we haven't put those in the show only because we have a wealth of material. This is an area that has not been, especially in. I mean, that's one of the great things. You know, we, we saw tonight in the presentation. We saw things from great collections and Art Institute of Chicago, very well known, known things, but also. We found troves of material at places like Syracuse University and in other private private collections. So it hasn't um, come up that we need um, we we haven't found work that um, we need for you know kind of to present that narrative because we have quite so so much already. And so we're kind of hoping to uh, I'm hoping that one of the things we can convey in the show is. A, a difference in almost a difference in American taste and engagement with Meiji art than necessarily European taste and other, and other times that we've seen it studied before without necessarily showing um, American artists who've gone to Japan. We do have some Japanese artists who've gone to Europe and America, um, but that hasn't been a focus. I think only because we have, there's just so much, there's so much stuff. And I think this period, at least in America is, is uh, it's under-examined, I think at least in depth. I think the certain things are, are constantly shown, but I don't know if you would agree, Chelsea, but I think really critically, and from this perspective that you, I think beautifully elucidated, which is really trying to posit the Meiji period is not solely Japan and US, but Japan on a shifting world stage. Mm -hmm. We have the collapse of the yeah. you know, empire at the same time, like that's not to be downplayed. Like this is a, a tumultuous period. So I think that the way you elucidated is great. And so we haven't included those things. It's not because we don't appreciate them. It's just because we have so much other stuff. But it would be great if other, and that's a great question. And hello, yes, Christine, great to have you. And um, maybe maybe some other venues would like to have simultaneously, you know, some such works. We would love to hear more about uh, artists that you would think would be uh, a good, you know, that would fit this category. And That's finally, true, yes. um, just before we end our session, one final question. Um, if you could, this is for both of you, if you could define this period in one or two sentences, what would you emphasize? What would kind of be your tagline for this um, period that you want to get across to your audiences? Well, I would go with, I think this is kind of something that Bradley um, reinforced for me, actually. So <laughs> I hope I'm not stealing your idea, Bradley, but I would say materiality, actually, that um, there, you know, we all know that this is a time period when oil painting becomes popular and artists are talking about photography and, you know, um, is is art limited to painting and sculpture or are, you know are lacquerware's art and so forth and so i think thinking about um and what japanese artists do to explore materials and bring even traditional materials to heights that you know hadn't been seen or in directions that hadn't been seen in the edo period fabulous thank you any last thoughts bradley I, first of all, I love that. I love that I brought you on to the, the side of material. I, and I, I agree. I think the period though, for me is it's a period of um, kind of initial shock and adaptation and then a real kind of internalization and innovation and a, and a kind of rearticulation of this, this modernity that you've just encountered and, 
and almost refined and, and articulated it. And beyond that, I think just a period, one of the things we didn't really touch on is that we've talked about Meiji period industrialization and how some of these objects, especially cloisonne, are produced to, um, and even today you would think a machine made it, but no, these are, these are handmade items. So I think it is a period of also dedication and just sheer determination, both, in, both good and bad. Um, you know, I think it leads, it leads the empire to some dark places, but I think it makes some great uh, art objects. And so we're hoping to kind of encapsulate all of that in this show. It's a, it's a short time period, but a lot to say, a lot to see. Indeed. I mean, and there's so many other questions. I wish we had time to get to them, but, you know, it, it's such a wealth of um, ideas and perspectives that you're bringing to the table. Um, it's such an innovative and exciting um, view that you're giving to audiences of this period. And so I really look forward to continuing our dialogue and to hosting more conversations on this topic with you both. Um, you know, I just want to thank again the Japanese Art Society of America for hosting this very special program. Um, it's been such a pleasure to speak with you both. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, it's my honor to pass the stage on to Mr. Graybill for the, um, the, uh, the meeting. Thank you so much, everybody.